which is screen readers and braille keyboards and switch devices. Screen reader is the device commonly used by blind and visually impaired users to describe what's on the screen. And semantic HTML, um, also say HTML5, is native, native HTML, and that's what tells browsers and assistive technology how to use websites and the apps. So, um, what, um, what is ARIA? And what does the term ARIA even mean, and what does it do? That was a terrible by the way. Um, ARIA is shorthand for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and it's a set of attributes added to HTML elements, and it defines a, um, ways to make content accessible to users of ABT, or assistive, assistive Technologies, and it bridges the gap when our issues can be managed with native HTML. So what, what is our, um, what does it, uh, the term RA even mean, and, and what does it do? Here we have a basic example of a search term, a search form using the commonly used role label search. So forms, uh, most of the time you'll, you'll see role labels form, uh, which will only need to be used will show uh, if you have like a div tag of role equals form. But if you have a search form, you need to actually use role equals search because that's um, specific to a search form. Um, this is different than the default, um, like I was explaining, uh, the form. And um, that's basically that. Um, what is ARIA? The term ARIA, what does it even mean and what does it do? Um, here we have two basic examples of using ARIA, uh, the ARIA role attribute. The first one, um, by adding role equals alert, the message gets read aloud to the screen for the user, user immediately. Um, role equals alert, I believe, is the same as ARIA live equals, um, I don't know, I can't remember. And um, it, it does um, assertive, it uses the assertive attribute. And, um, by adding role equals status, the message gets read aloud to the screen readers um, at the next opportunity and doesn't get read the current task. And that's what you want to default to, is not status, but not um, role equals alert. You want to use that um, on a case-by-case -case basis and not all the time. Where does ARIA come from? And what are its origins? And who is managing it now? First, um, it was developed by the ARIA Review Group as part of W3C's Web Accessibility Initiative, or WAI. Um, the working draft was first published in September 26, 2006. The current recommendation is the um, way, way ARIA 1.2 um, that was completed in March of 2014. And they have a draft in development with um, WAI ARIA 1.3. Who is it for, and and how do people with disabilities use it, and what kind of support is there for it? So, um, people with disabilities use it in two main ways. Um, the first main one is that's the AT, the assistive technologies. Um, so that would be software and hardware um, used by users with disabilities to assist them in gathering the content on the web. Um, that would be. Um, Examples like screen readers, screen magnification, um, screen recognition software. And then the second way would be adaptive strategies, and that's where you have the text resize and captions. Um, you have um, slowing down the mouse movement, um, maybe in your system, if you have a Mac, you have a motion reduction, that would be an example. A dark mode would be another example. Um, and any of these get added to the accessibility tree. Okay, what kind of support is there for ARIA? So, ARIA is not supported by all technologies, but it's always growing. Um, supporters include browsers, AT, so screen readers and magnifiers, applications, and JavaScript toolkits. Um, complete support is difficult to achieve because of its complexity. So, most current technology supports some form of ARIA, but not 100% of it. And you can uh, track its progress at Power Mapper, uh, Power Mapper RA support by user agent. Um, I do have these slides um, added to my LinkedIn account. 
which is, which is Cat and Shaw. And so you can access them there. There is also a QR code and a link at the beginning, and I can uh, show that back to you if you need it for all of these links. Are you in HTML5? So our HTML5 doesn't have 100% browser and screen reader support. And because of this, it's very important to check the support status of the HTML5 elements that you're using. Um, when they don't have full support, um, it's important to add both the HTML5 and the ARIA attributes. Um, you can check those um, by using those resources that have linked there. So what can, it, what can ARIA do? So let's discuss what it can do and it cannot do. And we'll talk about the ARIA roles, states, and properties that you probably see quite a bit. So first, what does and doesn't it do? So it does modify how content is presented to AT users in the accessibility tree. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't add functionality or behavior to an element, including JavaScript behavior. And it doesn't change an element structure in DOM. Instead, it enhances it. So um, that link there will um, allow you to review the the ARIA accessibility for more information with many more details that I didn't want to talk about in this presentation. First, let's go over ARIA roles. Um, they are used to define a type of user interface element or UI. Uh, once a role is set to an element, it does not change. Uh, the type of roles would be abstract roles, document structure roles, landmark roles, and widget roles. And some examples would be role equals alert, role equals search, Role equals document and role equals content info. So, are you abstract roles? What are they? They are, um, while acting as the foundation for all other roles, abstract roles are utilized by browsers and should not be used in code. Um, instead, they're used to give roles their meaning and context and help with the addition of new roles. Um, how is it used by the user? The abstract roles are in the background, so they should not be adjusted. Um, document structure roles. Um, what are they? They uh, provide descriptions or sections within a page, and they aren't normally interactive. Um, common ones that you'll see are image, document, heading, list, list item, and toolbar. And how does it get used by the user? Um, it identifies content while navigating through a page. And this helps them um, get context of the content they're digging in. Um, while HTML5 may provide uh, much of this context on its own, screener support for HTML5 is sometimes missing. And that's why this issue is why uh, ARIA is using those cases. So that's again why sometimes you need to use um, both, both in your code. ARIA landmark roles. Um, this is one that a lot of people know about. Um, what are they used for? They create uh, easier navigation. And they also identify each section of content on the page. And so this is a, I have banner, content info, form, main, navigation, and search. Those are the HTML4 um, landmark roles. The match for those, um, I'll show you on the next page. Um, how does it get used by the user? Um, they navigate through the page. Um, and an example would be a screen reader um, will announce the start and end of each landmark role set on a page, and its web rotor will display a list of these roles and regions. And the rotor is um, a, a screen reader will use a rotor to display like headings, um, links, and different information to quickly go to different parts of a page. Um, there, the next one would be widget roles, and there's two types of widget roles. There's a standalone UI widget role, and there's a composite widget role. Um, the standalone ones are, um, they add semantic meaning to elements and UIs, um, small and large. They're used when HTML doesn't define elements, and they're part of larger, larger composite widgets. Uh, commonly used examples are the alert, the button, checkbox, link, menu item, tab, and pan tab panel. And then how does it get used by the user? Um, it, they interact with the page to get things done, and that can include completing forms, opening and closing tabs and panels, and navigating the menus like a menu or sidebar menu. 
And composite UIs also use semantic meaning to um, add semantic meaning to use all UIs, small and large, but they act as containers that manage other containers. So that a common examples would be the combo box, grid, list box, menu, radio group, and tablet. And they um, get used by the user by uh, interacting with the page to get things done. And they include the same things as the other one. States and properties. You'll notice that I have these two grouped together, even though they're two different things. Um, this is because they're often, uh, they are often grouped together by the, the wide area specification. So I want to go over some similarities and some differences. Um, so similar, some similarities would be they have very similar features. They both give specific information about an object. Both form part of the definition of the nature of the goals. And both are treated as ARIA prefix and markup attributes. And that means it allows the developers to modify an element's properties and states in the accessibility tree. tree. The differences are that property values are less likely to change and state values can change frequently. Um, some additional information would be there are exceptions to the rule, so it's not like set in stone. Um, and both are commonly referred to attributes by um, white area. Uh, the next one would be drag and drop attributes. Um, what are they? they? They convey information to AT about drag and drop elements. They include drivable elements and their drop targets. Um, commonly used examples would be RA drop effect and RA graph. Um, and it's used by the user um, for drag and drop attributes to interact with drag and drop components uh, using various methods regarding their disability. Regardless of their disability, sorry. Next up, we have live region attributes. Uh, do a time check here, okay. Um, they indicate changes in content for a user's AT, such as setting whether a message will be read aloud with the flow of content, so that would be the ARIA line equals polite, or instead will interrupt the flow of content and be read aloud immediately, and that's where you have the ARIA line equals assertive. And the default is ARIA line equals polite, so, um, but if you add the, what I was mentioning earlier, the role equals alert, that will automatically use the ARIA equals assertive. Um, these elements don't need to have focus, and they can include information on how the user can proceed. Um, commonly used examples are ARIA Atomic, ARIA Busy, and ARIA Live. Um, they inform the user what's happening on the page with regular messages, and such as things, you know, a status or like we talked about just a message. Um, they provide notifications to user, users after forms have been submitted. And then uh, we have relationship attributes. They um, add relationships between elements that, can, that can't be determined otherwise. So uh, you'll see um, common examples like ARIA described by or ARIA labeled by. Um, how does this get used? Um, it gets used to understand when information is related, when navigating the page, and to gather in, um, additional information or data from various elements like forms, menus, and tabs and panels. Okay, talk about widget attributes. They are used for common UI elements that receive input from users while processing, processing those actions and information. Um, we have ARIA checked, ARIA disabled, ARIA labeled, ARIA required, and these get used to more easily utilize UI elements like forms and modals, and the, they help to avoid confusion during the input process. So finally, we're through all of that stuff, which is very sleepy, and when should we use ARIA? Um, this is a great question, and it's funny to ask, because we're, we're going to talk about the five rules of ARIA use. Um, this was a developed by the web platform working group. Um, they create, this creates guidance in answering this question. Uh, the W3C published them as part of the, the YRA specification, and we're going to go over them now. So the first rule of ARIA is 
to use native HTML at all times unless it's absolutely, positively impossible to make an admin accessible otherwise. So I'd say when in doubt, use native HTML. Um, some examples of when this may not be possible include when the HTML5 element doesn't have accessibility support. Um, you can use that link that's there to check the status of the HTML5 accessibility site. You, using that site, it's a great site. Um, another example is if the design doesn't allow for a specific native element because of limitations on styling. Um, and when the RA role or property isn't available in native, um, with native HTML. And there's another link to check the status of that. The second rule of ARI is do not change native HTML semantics unless you absolutely have to. In most cases, in almost all cases, native HTML will work just fine. ARI does not get added to the DOM, the document object model. Um, it basically sits beside it and enhances it. So any objects created in the browser will not automatically become what they are trying to emulate. Um, here's a, an example of that. Um, you know, you'll see this on a lot of sites where maybe they'll use a tag or a span tag and they'll have rolling this button with some maybe some JavaScript and they'll think that that will be interpreted by the browser as a button, but that it, what happens is um, a, a screen reader um, user or a keyboard user, if they click the uh, space bar with the normal interaction, uh, it won't actually uh, fire off trigger properly because a, a regular HTML button will, it, it's, that's what it's for. So it's best to just go with the standard native HTML button to do what you need to do. The third rule of ARIA is all interactive ARIA controls must be keyboard accessible. So for elements that don't normally receive keyboard focus, they should add tab index equal zero to the element to add it to the logical tab order. Um, never add a positive number to the tab index attribute. I guess you could argue that zero is positive, but it really isn't. So I'll just I'll just say that. Um, doing so, adding one or greater adds the element to the tab order, and that makes the application in, um, inaccessible. You. Um, Maybe you've done accessibility testing, you can see that by, um, or even just regular keyboard testing, and clicking the tab key, uh, you might go from the header to the footer to the content, you know, and that's, that's what I mean by that. So you don't want really to mess with the tab or the page. Um, so in this example, we have uh, a tab in this one, uh, image integrated one, um, but if you have one, it's going to go right to where that is on the page. That's going to be the, the first item to fix the tab uh, in the tab order. Instead of that, we'll add tab in is equal zero. So what happens is, as you're going through the page, that will be added to the tab order, but it won't be the first item added to the tab order. The fourth rule of ARIA is for all elements that are focusable, do not ever add role equals presentation or are hidden, hidden equals true. Um, for some users, this results in them getting keyboard focus on elements they can't access, causing confusion. Um, any focusable elements, like links or important elements, this is um, the case for, uh, any element that has tab index equals zero is also included in this list. So, uh, for example, when creating a disabled submit button, instead of um, button RA hidden equals true, um, you would use button, you know, RA disabled equals true to disable the button and then, you know, use whatever JavaScript or CSS you need to use when the button doesn't need to be disabled anymore. By adding the RA hidden, you're actually making it so that they can focus on that button, but it's hidden so they can't actually use it. It's very frustrating. You should just never do that to focus for all The fifth rule of RA is that you must give all interactive elements an accessible name, or also a label. Um, this only happens when the interactive element's accessible name has a value. Uh, most of the time, like in a button, if you call it search, that's the label. You don't need to add an RA label unless you're trying to add something um, more descriptive. So um, the first example uh, has a span with the search and input. 
uh, next to it, and I have seen this quite a bit um, where they're trying to use the search as a label. Um, wait, instead of that, we need to actually create a label element um, and the form of search connects to the input. Um, you'll notice the input has the ID search. Another way of doing that, if you want to hide, visually hide the um, label, one way of doing that is to just add a label to the search, and that will do the same thing as the first one, but the um, label will be visually hidden from site users. When should I use ARIA? So let's go over some real world examples of when you should use it. Um, so descriptive labels, um, when you need to add more descriptive labels to um, HTML, uh, that would be an example, like a button or a link. Uh, you can use ARIA label or ARIA label by. So this example, you have an ARIA label which read more about sustainable gardening. Uh, the first one just has uh, the read more. You'll see that a lot on sites for read more, read more, read more. What happens for screen review users is when they pull their rotor up their list, um, they'll just see read more, read more, read more. That gives no context for them. So by adding um, the ARIA label read more about sustainable gardening, that's what they're going to see. They're going to see read more about sustainable gardening, read more about Japanese gardens. You know, they're going to see um, very unique links on their list, and that's why you do that. Uh, line regions. For events to get announced to screen readers, uh, ARIA line regions must be added to those elements. Um, they help AT to detect and read aloud those changes. So that's um, instead of using like a class alert message and expecting that to get read aloud to a screen reader, you want to add roll equals alert if you want it to be read right away. Relationships um, to create parent child relationships between elements. That's where you would use the ARIA label by, ARIA inscribed by, and all of these other examples. Um, so let's see here. Um, in this example here, we have a, an image has, uh, that contains a sunflower field uh, and it has an ARIA detailed attribute. And uh, the value of the ARIA detailed attribute is the ID from the details element that's below it. And the details element contains a more meaningful description for the sunflower field image. And it has an ID attribute that equals the ARIA details um, attribute from the image. And so that creates a parent child relationship between the two. And that's specific, obviously, for screen review users. So, forms adding an ARIA attribute to form elements make forms accessible for users and screen readers. Um, it helps them to bec um, become easier to interact with, and common examples are a label by or a label autocomplete. Um, this uh, example here, we have the um, we have the uh, four with the first name, with the label and the input, and then we have required equals true, autocomplete equals given name, and aria autocomplete equals inline. Um, we'll talk more about. Uh, those later on in the presentation. Um, how does Drupal use ARIA? Uh, next up, let's talk about um, how ARIA has incorporated, uh, how Drupal has incorporated accessibility, including ARIA, into core and its contributed modules um, with its accessibility um, policies and best practices. Uh, thanks to the accessibility initiative that started in Drupal 7 and has continued to this day, um, there have been many advances with accessibility um, in core and contributed modules to deliver accessibility to um, users of AT and all users, really. So we're going to talk about some built-in modules and features of core, and we'll also talk about a couple of uh, contributed modules that have been created specifically for accessibility. So the first feature would be our alerts. And they are provided via uh, Drupal's um, Drupal Announce JavaScript method. Um, this allows blind users and users with visual disabilities to use AT to hear a on the page. And the two allowable values for our live um, attribute with this are polite and assertive. We talked about that earlier. So this is really great um, that they allow this um, to be used by developers. So. The um, next one would be inline form errors. Uh, this module adds form errors to Drupal Core. 
they are now in a light bulb, which is great news. used to be the opposite, and we've disabled you have to enable it. So um, when users fill out a form, uh, a link summary of the errors appears above the form. Uh, those links, when the user clicks them, they go to the, the field that has it, the error. And below each field, there's an inline form error that uh, appears. It's in red font that is uh, passes color contrast testing. And to the left of the error um, is an icon, and that's specific for uh, users with um, color or color blindness because um, they're not going to be able to tell that that's any different than regular text if they have color blindness and they you know, can't see red. Um, and all of the errors in the code are marked up with ARIA to make sure that the screen reader user can know what is all connected. So that helps them drill down what, um, what items are correct and what, what items need to be corrected. Um, tab order for keyboard accessibility. Um, for keyboard only and screen, screen reader users, tab order is a top priority. So with Drupal's tab, uh, tapping manager, developers can add or remove tab constraints from a page using control tab order. Um, so examples would be modals and dialogues and pop-up and messages, which we all love so much. Um, key elements in Twig templates actually automatically receive keyboard focus. Uh, a good example of this would be the skip to main content link that's in Drupal, um, which is wonderful. Um, which is the first item that if you tab on a page in, in a Drupal site, you'll see the skip to make content. Um, next up is views. So several auto attributes can be added with the views module. So a good example that I've used in the past is to add a meaningful label to a repo link on the site. Uh, you would open a view, select a field, open the rewrite section, and add a bit of custom code combining tokens to create a descriptive label. And here's some markup of how you would do that. So you would add read more about and you add the token title, and then in the, you have the link and you have the title. So for, if you saw that earlier example, in the screen reader user is going to see on the list read more about where the title is, and the sighted user is just going to see either the title or the more. Um, next up, we have the themes and admin menu. So, Olivera and Claire were both added to Core not too long ago, which is great. Um, and the new um, navigation menu was recently added to Core as well. They, I, think, I believe it's experimental. Um, yeah. uh, they all incorporated and tested for accessibility from the start, which is wonderful, and it's really how everything should be when you're doing any project or module feature or anything. Um, this included semantic HTML and the addition of ARIA only when necessary, and this process resulted in much improved experience for users of Drupal-based sites. Another one is block ARIA landmark roles. Um, it adds additional elements to the block configuration forms. Uh, and it gives site builders the ability to add landmark roles to any block in the site. So when you go to the block UI, you, um, you, know, you click the block and it just adds more fields there and you can add the different landmark roles that you need. There's also a block class module that I kind of always team together and I'm not positive it still works with the updated versions of Drupal, but you can add classes to your blocks to Drupal. Um, there's a module called CK Editor Abbreviation, and with that you can add a, an abbreviation button to your toolbar in CK Editor. Um, when users select the button, it creates a, an accessible abbreviation to the location of the user's cursor. So, you know, um, trying to think of a good example. I guess street, you know, ST. You know, and they hover in the street or something like that. It's just there's a lot of times that on sites where we just default two abbreviations to save space, but it's not always an accessible um, thing to do. And so when you have, especially um, like what cat would be a good example, you would want to make sure that that uh, would have what content accessible standards um, used in that way. 
Um, and texture size, um, it adds a texture size tool for users with low vision in a block. And it includes two buttons, an increased text size with a plus and a decreased text size with a minus. Um, and that's very useful, useful for users with visual disabilities and regular users with you know, we all like texture size. So what confusion is there on how, when, or if and when to use ARIA? Um, there is confusion, as everybody knows, and we'll discuss some examples of that. So, I think the first one is the button versus link versus anchor. Um, how can you tell which one to use? Uh, somebody explained this to me one or two years ago, and it, it was great. Uh, helped me in my head. Uh, a button stays on the same page, so that's a form or a search would be a good example. A link redirects to another page. So documents, content pages. And then anchor links to another section on the same page. So that's when you get back to the top of the bookmarks. So um, will adding roll equals button to a div tag turn it into a button? We discussed that earlier. No, you shouldn't use semantic. Uh, you should use semantic HTML to create a button. Um, sometimes you have to use that for a certain custom situation. And then you're going to have to add a lot of additional um, code to make, make it work, like native HTML. Uh, it's, to me, it's just not worth the time. Um, button activation is done with spacebar, and link and anchor activation is done with enter and return. Um, another one is redundant ARIA landmark roles. Uh, using ARIA landmark roles and HTML5 landmark Landmark tools together is, is now considered redundant and no longer necessary in modern browsers. It was done to, um, in the past due to inconsistent coverage of landmark rules in HTML. But if you are just supporting modern browsers and not trying to support IE 11, you can say, okay, I'm just going to use the HTML5 um, elements and not the old. Um, and I'll post the HTML for I'll show an example and then um, so landmark roles landmark roles are automatically detected um, with the HTML5 elements. So here's a list of HTML5 elements and their paired HTML5 landmark roles. So you'll notice on the left here uh, you would use let's just say a div tag. You do div and then roll equals banner. It, that's the same as using a header tag, or you, you would use um, div role against form. That's the same as a form tag. So you don't need to use um, form and then role equals form. That's redundant if you're just supporting other browsers. Um, so it's just not necessary, and that happens quite a bit. So I would just check your code if, you're, if that's if you were just supporting other browsers. Okay. Um, Confusion on using HTML5 and uh, an ARIA. Uh, one big area of confusion relates to the first rule of ARIA. If you'll remember, that was you native HTML all the time unless it's absolutely positively impossible to make an element um, accessible otherwise. Um, and it's understandable with this confusion um, to use the attributes versus the ARIA attributes. Uh, two common examples are required versus ARIA required and autocomplete versus ARIA autocomplete. Um, but luckily there is a, a W3C HTML accessibility task force that is addressing these issues as we speak and you can check that link out. Um, the first example I'm going to show is the required field. Um, with this example that you see, uh, we have the label and we have the input and it has RA required equals true and auto complete on. The required, um, in this case, it's not necessary to use both if you're not supporting other browsers. Um, the RA required is used on custom non semantic elements that are required to retain an RA role, like rolling equals radio. The required is used on semantic HTML form controls that are required. So for autocomplete, um, in this case, it is necessary to use both because they serve two different purposes. 
the um, possible values and auto complete are off and on and tokenized. Um, it auto uh, fills fields with values for the user agents, so the user agents are browsers. Uh, the tokens list is where you get the given name, which is the first name, and you know, the list, like the phone, and things like that. ARIA autocomplete um, possible values are none inline list, inline list of both. That informs the user on what type of autocomplete is being used. So uh, that's used for combo box, search box, or text box. And so that'll tell you if it's a list, or a text box, or nothing, whatever. Um, so those two things can be used in conjunction with each other. Uh, some say never use ARIA, and that's totally understandable. Um, mostly that happens because of the overuse of ARIA. Um, but according to the Paciello Group's own ARIA rules and properties not available in HTML5, several of them are needed to make the web easier to navigate and use for um, users of AT. So uh, that's it. I can't believe I actually have done time. So, uh, three takeaways I'd say is stick with native HTML controls whenever possible. Use ARIA as a last resort when elements cannot be made accessible otherwise. And remember that it's a balancing act and you've got this and ARIA ready. Right? Fun thing, I love puns. Um, and that's it. Got questions? Anything? 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 Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question was when there is a button on the page and it takes you to somewhere on the same page, is that is that really a button or a link? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like a different page, like a lot of times you have a search button. Mm -hmm. it's there on the same page. Yeah. yeah, so what that really is, um, it like uh, uh, most sites have a search on the top and they have a button next to it. That actually is a button that does submit a form, and that in that case it would take you to a search results page. So that is kind of a that's an interesting case. That that does uh, go against what I was saying. But if you uh, submit like a form, and you let's say you're submitting an application, uh, once you're done submitting that application, it's usually going to give you a hey, you did it successful, or whatever. Sometimes it'll redirect you to a page and say it's successful. So in that kind of case, it's the form doing whatever it needs to do to, to submit that form. What I was talking more about is the actions that take place on the same page before it does a redirect. A link is, is specifically meant to take you to different pages. That's all it does. It doesn't do any kind of JavaScript or uh, form submittal or anything like that. But that's good. I'm going to actually add that as an asterisk on my next presentation. So building off that, sometimes we'll style the link as a button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, we do that quite a bit. Um, there are some that believe that you should never style a link as a button, but in reality, you know, clients want links styled as buttons, and so if you, as long as the semantics are that it's a link or a button and it's used properly, that's that's how I feel about it. Is that when a screen reader user comes across a button or a link that it's proper in a semantic way versus visually. Um, also, you just want to make sure that all of the other standards like color contrast, um, focus visibility, all of that kind of stuff passes. If, it, if it's a link, you want to make sure all of those things pass. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, actually, I was going to include this. Uh, let me get out of here. I don't know if I can do this. Here. I have a, an article that I did um, called How Cool Accessibility Tools Can Make Your Life Easier. And um, it was a lot of my tools that I use on a daily basis. And let me see if I can get it over there. So it's on the little website. Um, 
So if you just look that up on the little website, it has a large group of tools. And by the way, the question was, uh, do you have any specific tools? I have a lot of tools. I have a lot of Chrome extensions. Um, and this does list the grouping. Um, I have web-based tools. I have, um, I have uh, desktop tools. I have operating system tools. Um, I have bookmark lists. I mean, it's just it's a really, really long list. And it, it depends on what the situation is that I use all of those. I also list under some Drupal tools that it's a little bit of presentation. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend all of those. Sometimes you want to use the larger ones to scan a site, like the accessibility insights or um, you know, site approved or whatever. But I'm I'm really the free things, so I try to go that way as much as possible. Anyone else? I think we're right at time. So if anybody has any questions that they're too afraid to ask in front of everybody, which I'm one of those people, or um, they can't think of until later, just uh, hit me up. Uh, let's see. Go back to the here again. This is not easy. It won't. There we go. Oh, I'm just going to do that. So I hope this doesn't give anybody a seizure. <laughs> There's all of my, um, these are links, like I said. Um, so when you get the slides, you'll be able to get to each of those. You can check out my GitHub, LinkedIn, Drupal, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I did put my personal email up there. So if I get spammed or whatever, yeah, it's on me. Um, that's my boy. I have a lot of pictures of my girl, so I'm going to make that in there. Uh, here's our 